Welcome back to NTV Weekend Edition. In our continuing series, 10 Years of Westgate, tonight we speak to Chief Magistrate Francis Andai, the man who sent to prison two terrorists who conspired with others to kill 67 people. He shares his experience handling that case and lessons Kenya has learned from its complexities. Welcome to this particular interview. This, this was a highly anticipated case. The entire world was watching. Everybody, rather, let me say, locally and internationally, their attention was here. Did it ever give you any pressure to deliver in a certain way? Yes, thank you, uh, Brian, for uh, this opportunity. Um, I'd like to say that uh, every case, uh, as a uh, pressure and uh, why because a uh, case involves two parties and uh, each of the parties expects uh, a decision in their favor and therefore uh, when a case comes before you you have to be cognizant of that fact and therefore uh, they are not big or small cases however um, a case like this one that uh, uh, touches on lives of people and a case that uh, has uh, that international attention as you have said and a case that has, uh, let's say, I think over 50 witnesses who testified in that case. Obviously, the pressure is going to be high, especially with uh, the manner in which you are handling uh, the case and also uh, just uh, ensuring that uh, every person who is involved has their rights uh, guaranteed and uh, uh, they are observed throughout the trial. So um, the pressure is there. But we thank God uh, we've been doing these things for a while and therefore we are able to take up the pressure. And maybe as a person, did this particular case bring any attention to your personal life? And if so, then how did you maneuver through it? I'm, I'm sure that uh, every time such a case comes up for hearing, there are uh, various people who are interested and they are listening to it. And therefore, obviously, you are in the public domain. Um, uh, as an individual, uh, when you are handling this uh, kind of case, uh, you must be aware of yourself because uh, you have to be aware of the circumstances that are surrounding the case. And I can't say that uh, uh, in my career what I have uh, learned to do is to separate work from my private life so that you will not find me uh, discussing or going around and saying that, uh, you know, uh, this is what is happening in this case and that has helped me a lot when i step into a courtroom that is when i start listening to the case once i step out uh, i step out of the the courtroom door you will be surprised but i don't discuss this whether at home or uh, with anybody uh, to go telling you that you know this is what i had this is the evidence that came through this is how challenging or difficult it was i have learned that if you want to live well then you have to, 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 to leave those uh, uh, kinds of things outside. You have to concentrate, separate your work from uh, your private life. This case was purely, or so it appeared to me, was purely built on circumstantial evidence. While we know that circumstantial evidence is most of the times used to supplement the primary evidence, how, how was the court then convinced to reach, to reach its decision that this form of circumstantial evidence could indeed make the court find the way it found. One of the things I want to thank you again for is the fact that uh, you read the decision of the case. And uh, uh, that uh, pleases me because many times you make decisions and uh, uh, people don't, don't read the decision. They'll start commending, they'll start making their own conclusions about the case, and yet they haven't done, uh, gone back to the case to read actually what the uh, judicial officer has uh, said in the case. So I'm quite pleased that uh, you are able to get into that detail and even pin out the fact that uh, this case was uh, almost, almost entirely dependent on circumstantial evidence. So circumstantial evidence is said under jurisprudence to be uh, one of the strongest pieces of evidence. And a case should not, cannot, should not necessarily be decided on uh, direct evidence. Uh, because uh, oftentimes uh, people commit offenses uh, 
under very difficult circumstances, or many offenses are co uh, committed in hiding, and therefore what remains is circumstantial evidence. So many, many times you will find that uh, courts depend on circumstantial evidence in order to find uh, that uh, someone is guilty or the accused person is, is guilty. So we must start from the premise that circumstantial evidence is oftentimes very strong evidence, and on it alone a court can uh, base a conviction. And therefore, in this case, as you have rightly pointed out, we, it was dependent largely on circumstantial evidence. But uh, for the convictions that were had, the circumstantial evidence was overwhelming. It was so strong that uh, the, 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 the accused person could not have extricated themselves out of it because uh, first of all, there is uh, direct evidence, either you were found with this article and this article then is connected to this one and this one, and then that is now what builds up the case. So there is the basis where there is the direct evidence, and then the major bit of it, which is circumstantial evidence, comes in, and uh, it was satisfactory and it met the required threshold of, uh, uh, of being convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that uh, the case had, uh, had been proved. But eventually the court then found that uh, for the second accused person, that is uh, Liban Abdullahi, he had been in contact with all these people. He was a brother to one of the terrorists. He said so, the prosecution agreed, and the court believed that that was not circumstantial evidence enough to put him behind bars, or even the third accused person who was, oh, he owned a school, a madrasa school in Eastleigh, where the prosecution told the court that uh, this madrasa teacher is the one who was involved in the purchase of the motor vehicle that the terrorists used, but then yet again, the court acquitted him. Well, um, I may not remember the details as such in terms of, uh, for instance, how many times that uh, you say that he had uh, communicated and, uh, and all that. But uh, uh, what I know is that uh, uh, you evaluate each piece of evidence and against each accused person uh, as it is. So what presented uh, before the court uh, in that respect did not meet the threshold of uh, being satisfied that uh, the third accused person uh, uh, had a case to answer and therefore he had to be acquitted at, uh, at, at, at that level or that uh, he had provided evidence that was uh, uh, convincing enough and it had rebutted the evidence that had been uh, provided by, uh, uh, by, by the prosecution. For instance, uh, there are cases, for instance, in this case, uh, some of the things that I've learned. Um, when you are um, uh, talking maybe to, um, uh, let's say, a, a family member, sometimes it becomes very, very difficult to draw the line between what type of communication was going on between the family member and the accused person or by one of those persons who are involved in the act of, of, of terrorism. So you, you can't say that uh, this is the number of times that uh, I can talk to my father or I can talk to my brother or I can talk to my sister in as much as there has been evidence probably that they were involved in a certain, in a certain offense. So now, if there is very strong evidence that indeed this is my brother and I stay with my brother, and the only thing then is that uh, I am communicating with my brother, then that is where we, we say there is, a, uh, there is a, a benefit of doubt. There is something in the law called benefit of doubt. It is not clear whether, because remember, the messages in communication are not brought out. They don't tell you that this is the kind of communication that these people were being involved in. What comes out is that there was, at least at that time, I don't know how advanced now the investigations have gone in order to reveal the particular uh, kind of uh, communication. But at that time, it's only the number of times that the communication has been had. If it is shown that you have a very uh, close relationship, and these 37 times are scattered in a period of, let's say, uh, th this is something that took a long time from the time of planning, uh, probably something like uh, 30, 40, 40 days, and probably you are communicating with uh, uh, your brother once or twice in a day, really you must get the benefit of doubt if there is no other evidence to connect you to that offense. And I think in as much as I can't remember exactly what the evidence against that uh, accused that you're talking about, I think that was the basis of the, of the acquittal.
And I know you may not be comfortable going into the details of the case, but this question I'm asking you as a judicial officer, whereby by virtue of that, you are an advocate of the rule of law. What does it mean when people like Liban Abdullahi, who was the second accused, he's been acquitted by the court, and then he's abducted by hooded men. These hooded men, circumstantial evidence, at least according to some of us, may have pointed to the involvement of police officers. What does it do to the judicial? Uh, what does it do to the judicial system in the country that someone is acquitted, has, is, a, is tried and acquitted, and then abducted? Well, um, when a court acquits a person, then uh, that's the end of the matter. For me, uh, as a trial uh, court, when I have acquitted a person, I end it there. What happens to the person afterwards, outside of the, of the court, really, the court doesn't follow because the court can only proceed with the matter that is before it, that has been brought uh, to it. And uh, if, for instance, uh, someone was to, to want to bring that kind of evidence uh, forward, I think they'll have to begin another matter altogether. It is unlikely that uh, the court having concluded the matter, under the law we say that the court is functus officio. You cannot reopen a matter that you have already uh, considered and made a verdict on it. And therefore, if there is such a thing, then again, uh, it is likely that uh, it has to go to another, uh, another, another court, and then the court which is seized of the matter at that particular time is going to evaluate the evidence and then find. Uh, because, again, uh, I, I don't want to say, as you have pointed out, that uh, the abduction was by uh, state uh, officers. Uh, really, uh, any abduction would be a bad thing if at all uh, any such a thing were to to happen, the Constitution provides that when someone is uh, uh, being arrested, you have to be told that uh, this is the reason that you are uh, being arrested, and uh, they have to be produced in court within a certain period, that is 24 hours, and uh, we all know that uh, we respect the Constitution. All um, uh, 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 state officers, in fact, every Kenyan is required to, to, to uphold the Constitution, uh, respect it, and actually defend the Constitution. So when the officers are carrying out, if at all they are officers, I believe they will be working within their professional mandate and they should be able to tell this person that uh, although you have been released by the court, we have a complaint against you and therefore we are taking you again into custody. That one as a court, uh, we may not uh, intervene. However, if it is anything that is illegal, anything that is untoward, Everybody, of course, will, uh, will, uh, will, will know that that is uh, in breach of the constitutional provisions and uh, uh, the, the right channels have to be followed. For instance, complaints to uh, the independent policing oversight authority, uh, complaints to the ombudsman, complaints to the, or uh, even filing, an, uh, 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 filing a case before the High Court for a habeas corpus that the person be produced. That is where that case is going to be considered. And so that I ask, as we come to a close. On matters of jurisprudence, what then can we say we've learned from this particular case? What can we say are the lessons we got from this case? And what can we do differently? Lessons for Kenya's legal system, so to speak. We have found that uh, circumstantial evidence as uh, was held in the case of uh, Kipkering Arab Koske, that is the, the, the main case, the locus classicus, that tells you that you can base your conviction on, on uh, circumstantial evidence. I also want to say that uh, in terms of uh, investigations, in terms of investigations of cases, I think uh, a lot of investigations has to be put into that. Perhaps the only thing that uh, I can point out is that uh, sometimes as Kenyans we demand that matters go to court very soon. However, when you as a judicial officer you are considering the case, you will think a little more, a little more investigation will have gone into, into uh, a case so that it is able to bring out all the evidence. Because a complex case like that one, which takes probably years uh, to plan and then execute, and it involves so many people, and uh, probably people want people to be brought before the court and, uh, and, 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 and tried and convicted within a very short time becomes a little uh, demanding for all the people who are working on it. So in terms of investigations, I think the police have uh, up to that level 
they were uh, trying their best and they did their best in order to collect that evidence. When it comes to court, uh, 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 the trial of that case, if you asked me, for instance, it will be a case where it is given one judicial officer and you can handle the case, like, let's say, consecutively, one, two, three weeks, so that it can come to uh, a conclusion. But you find that uh, in, in our setting, due to the limited number of judicial officers, we are not able to have a case proceed on a day-to-day -day basis until it is concluded. Because, for instance, when I was handling that particular case, I was also handling the, the Garissa case and, and, and very many other cases which you would call uh, high-profile cases. It becomes difficult for the judicial officer who is handling all these cases to say, let me concentrate on one case for two, one month, and then uh, uh, we conclude it, and then we go to, to the next case. So in terms of uh, then uh, how to arrange for such cases, I will say when such a case, and it's good now, uh, we now have a specialized court to deal with uh, anti-terrorism matters, and I believe now it will be able to, to handle such cases more expeditiously uh, than we have done before. Not so long ago, uh, a murder convict moved the court to allow the magistrate's court to hear murder cases. The reason here was that these people are then able to have as many levels of appeal as possible, where they're able to have their side of the story or the, their side of the case, what you may want to call the defense hard. But then I ask, looking at cases of terrorism, do you think they are so humongous, so consequential, that maybe these are cases that should be heard by a higher court, let's say the high court or even the Supreme Court, because they affect the entire nation in a very big way? As, as, as you've said, the primary reasoning in criminal cases is that an accused person should get the widest possible uh, spectrum of uh, you know, presenting their case. You've seen cases which start at the lower court, and then uh, you've seen even nowadays the DPP has a, a right, uh, the, the court declared that the DPP has a right. In, uh, uh, previously, the DPP would not uh, uh, appeal against uh, an acquittal, but nowadays the DPP has a right to appeal against acquittal. You will be uh, aware that there is a case that started in the lower court where the accused, a terrorism case also, the accused persons were convicted by the lower court. When they went to the high court, the uh, high court upheld that decision. When they went to the court of appeal, the court of appeal acquitted and, uh, and uh, acquitted. But when they went to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court again did what? Uh, convicted. So we are saying, when, uh, what I'm saying, I, I will say myself, that uh, it, you know, they get that uh, wide uh, opportunity to present their case. And when they have uh, reached the apex court, they would be satisfied that there is no more that I can do in this case. This case has determined this. And I think the case that we're talking about has already been determined by, by the High Court. So it's just a matter of giving them that opportunity beginning from, uh, from the beginning. And the argument that uh, you are putting across is the same that they have put across. If the, 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 the lower court, for instance, handles robber with violence, whose, uh, 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 whose punishment is, is death and then also murder, uh, I mean, uh, they, it also handle, uh, then murder is handled by the high court. Why can't also murder be handled in the, in the, uh, in the lower court? But I think uh, it, it's a good point. I think every uh, advocate, as we usually say, has their own opinion on the matter. But uh, it is a good point that uh, should be discussed and should be evaluated by the court so that uh, a decision is hard. And uh, if it is only to uphold the right to give the accused persons an opportunity to present their cases, for, uh, or give them the widest opportunity, why not? It, that, that will be uh, proper. Yes. Thank you so much, Francis and I, for, for your time and for, of course, agreeing to share with us your reflections of that particular case. 190 pages of a judgment, 146 witnesses, and all this time put into that trial is no mean feat. Thank you so much for, for your time. Okay. Thank you. Ten years after Westgate, that interview there with NTV's Brian Obuya.
All right, well, that, in fact, closes this broadcast. You have been watching NTV Weekend Edition on this Friday night. Thanks so much for your company. I'm Smriti Vidyarthi, and our sign language interpreter has been David Agondua. We say good night, but stay tuned. The trend continues now. This is NTV. Stay five degrees cooler. Body odor is caused by germs, and on active days, the sweating and odor are more. That's why you need the new improved Dettol Cool with up to five degrees instant cooling sensation and odor protection. Be Dettol sure. If you're hungry for chapos, make it ajab. Easy. Kamatis and samos prepared just easy. No stress, no mess when you're needing easy. Ajab is a soft rolls out, so easy. So quick.